This is one take, or... <laughs> take two. <laughs> Didn't I beat you in chess? Uh, yeah, you, you did beat me in chess that one time. Um, <clears throat> Ed, why are you proud of me? Well, I'm proud of you because you love the Lord, you worship Him, and you put Him first in your life, and you want other people to know who He is. Why am I proud of you? Because you're me, and I love who you are, and you're the best version of me. I'm proud of you because you are not afraid to be you, that you work hard, and that you find joy in all the things you do in your life. Dad, why are you proud of me? <sighs> because you always work hard, because you're never afraid to face something that's difficult, and you always push through. Yeah, man. Why couldn't I know this question beforehand? I would have prepped the whole thing. No. <laughs> I am extremely grateful out of many things um, for your presence and the fact that as your son, I have always had an excuse to be in your presence. I'm grateful for you because God brought you into my life. And you're kind. It. You also help others, and you help me. I am grateful that you have always been a provider and a protector my whole life. No matter what I've done, no matter what is going on, whatever is happening, I know I can always count on you to be there and to fix all the problems <laughs> regardless of what's going on. Dad, why I love you so much is you always take care of the family and you have provided us with such a blessed life and taught me so many important things on how to be a great and loving and just a great woman of God and I'm so blessed that you're my dad. Dad, I'm grateful for you because you give me food and shelter. Those are good things, Dad. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm very, very lucky to have you as dad. I'm very yeah. grateful for you because I feel like you've, you've done a lot for me and you've taught me a lot of like, like life lessons of like how to be like generous to people, like when you work at the life center and how how like how to spend time with people and you know how how to love Jesus too. And you've helped me with all those areas of my life. I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a hug. I love you. Love you too. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you. We want to welcome those who are joining us online. Happy Father's Day to all the dads in this place. For those who are here for the very first time, we are so thankful that you are here. To all the wannabe dads and the dads as his, or the men that says, I'll never be a dad, never say never. God plays cosmic jokes with people like you. We are so thankful. And it's a wonderful day because the gift of children is such an incredible gift because God will always give you yourself and your children. That is the cosmic joke of all times. When they want to play you with the games that you invented, the games you played your parents, they want to play you. And today we've got a whole group of men and every one of their stories are unique because you know in life what we plan and what gets handed to us sometimes is so um, different. But in all of it, like God is a good father, uh, 
fathering is part of his nature in us and if you think about the kindness of our heavenly father you know I, I keep saying to people you can ignore them but you can never unchild them because they are bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh image bearers of your own soul and today each of these guys are going to be sharing some wisdom because they are all at different stages and family structures and my prayer is that somehow their words will find a place and an echo in your heart so that you know that no matter how you think you have done there is always the next because there is no final chapter with God he is extraordinary in writing new chapters new beginnings able to redeem any story any situation so I'm excited for these guys to share and um, we, we're going to start with you again, Jeremy. I have known Jeremy a long time, and Jeremy is one of those guys that can fix anything, build anything, um, arrange anything. He is a master when it comes to organizational things, and um, always strong, always buoyant. And then last year, you received devastating news and for the first time your children had to face a father that is not the superhero that can simply go get tools and fix it can you share with us what happened and how you fathered your family through that yeah absolutely thank you Pierre thanks for the opportunity uh, <clears throat> many of you might remember this but last year at this time uh, I think 200 250 Father's Day cards got written out and came flooding into my room at Strong on the sixth floor in the leukemia unit uh, that was awesome made me cry and yeah so the end of April I was working on a job with my friend George uh, having a great day it was a beautiful day out I got a call from another friend Dr. Angela <clears throat> I thought I had some poison ivy symptoms and got some blood work done and the call was essentially actually you have leukemia um, we should meet uh, sit down with your wife and that was uh, that was obviously not something that anyone just thinks hey this is what we'll find out today uh, so we sat down together went over it's, it's not a great prognosis uh, but at the end of the day, the thing that I had to do, and I actually did it on the drive to my wife, was give her and give my children to God. Um, because, you know, as you said, Pierre, you know, I love to build. You know, I've been blessed by God to be able to provide, and, and my wife works as well. But we've been able to have a good home, you know, and our kids can, can be in soccer. Um, being here in the church. There's so many, so many blessings, but I've always worked. And, and I kind of took it the same way. You know, the doctor said, you have three weeks, uh, or they said, you need to come in, you know, ASAP, actually. And I said, well, I need three weeks. You know, I <laughs> wrote my own script and <clears throat> got the next test and the, the white blood, the blast cells, as you will, have increased now dramatically. They said, you can't go with that timeline. Um, okay, so I won't finish the deck, but I will take my son on this trip and I'll put a pool up for my boys as I had committed to before going in as well. Another blood test comes back. Yeah, that won't work. You need to be in and, and really tomorrow. And I said, well, that, that's not going to happen. I'll come in Sunday. So you can see this is like my battle, right? I'm controlling the scenario. Um, and I had to say to my son, I'm sorry, we can't have this, this trip together. He turned 12, but we will. And so now I have this objective, get the swimming pool up, which was very significant because it was my way of saying, I'm your dad. Like, I love you guys. And I called up some, um, some strong, capable guys um, who are in the trades. 
and then a whole bunch of, of great other dudes and girls came and we all were working together. But at the end of that day, I literally had <laughs> a circle of sand with a rim around it and some, you know, everything else on a pallet still. And I remember looking at my friend Jason and saying, Jason, uh, I can't finish this. Like I hit the wall and he said, well, you can't, but we will. And I had, you know, I just had to start crying there in the, in the sand on my hands, just tears falling as I realized, like, okay, it's, it's not in my hands, but something good is, is still happening here. And the next day, as I'm entering the unit, and I'm able to see a live feed, I could see my buddies and another gentleman named Ronnie working and putting this pool up. And I, I felt God saying, yes, you're their dad, but I'm their father. And that was, that was transformative for me in understanding my God. You know, like, this is real. Um, God, you're real. And so many things happened in those months, Pierre, where I, I just got broken again and again and again from financially, you know, people paying for our mortgage. Uh, our soccer team doing a fundraiser and you know this got this is covered um, we can still do our vacation in between the, the hospital and I'm not working you know so this shouldn't be happening and God's God's basically arranged everything that no it's okay it's all working out though um, so for my boys the hardest thing was just being away from them um, there's a lot of restrictions. So, you know, I, I could text how you guys doing. And they're playing video games. You know, they're outside kicking the ball around. I might hear back the next day. And they love me. And I love them. But that was a reality. If I try to call, it, it might not get through. Or I'll, I'll be able to get a call in the evening. But they're busy, busy lives. And I remember I, I, this was when I was so broken. I told my wife, I don't think they love me. And that was like, I started to cry. She's like, what's going on? I'm like, I haven't, I don't think they love me. And she's like, we're gonna change that. <laughs> and man, that girl, you know, I mean, obviously our kids love us, right? There's no doubt. But she was like, well, oh, better start talking about your day, you know? <laughs> I don't care what you say, something's gonna come out of your mouth. And I, I, my boys are all boy, you know what I mean? It's, it's great. She smuggled them in once, got in a lot of trouble. It was awesome. Actually, the lead doctor told us we should do that. And <laughs> the lead nurse didn't know. We did not tell on the lead doctor, though. Um, but the, the ability to be a dad in that time was, was totally different. Uh, totally different. And I just realized, you know what? Everything I get is a gift, every opportunity. And sometimes it was literally, I'm watching the screen of my wife as my kids somewhere in the field chasing a ball, you know, and I'm getting a seasickness. You know, <laughs> baby, you're pointing out of the, the grass blades right now. Go up a little bit. Uh, a little too high, baby, baby. You know, or they score and she's pointing the camera at the, the wrong side of the goalie and she's shouting. So that was the world of just fun. And I learned, you know what, let's roll with it. God was so faithful. And the biggest gift out of it, not the, not the biggest, one, one huge gift was my personal dad left Africa. He's a missionary with my mom. They came, they lived in someone's basement so they could be near me and just came every day. And they went to soccer games when I couldn't go. So I, I literally, I vicariously lived through people I love to be a dad for my kids. That was amazing. Uh, Jeremy, I'm very intrigued how your boys always viewed you as the strong, in control, and then you sit with mortality. We know God can, God will, but it doesn't always play out that way. How did you communicate with your boys? How did the conversation becomes, I have, you have to hear me because I may not be able to say it again. How did 
that change the relationship? It's a great question. Um, they definitely, they definitely had. I think they cried when they weren't with me around the fact that I could die. Um, and we have good friends. I have a, a very good friend who who died uh, six weeks ago from uh, tumors, and he's got kids my age. And and I and I love him, and I love his family. And so it's real. You know, this is real. Um, death can come in God's plan. Um, and for me and my kids, I think just the fact that our God is an eternal God with real love, with real truth, with real hope, with a real Jesus, um, it, we didn't have to change the script. It, it was literally, hey, God knows, you know, and um, this day's a gift. I love you. You know, and, and some of the processing, I think, we might still be done 10 years from now up here. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, I'm not sure I, I gave them the right answer, but I, I also know I never tried to posture. I just, uh, I just was as present as I could be. And I'm so thankful God, like, literally took any fear away from me. So I was just happy, like, when I was with him. I was one bald, happy guy. You know, <laughs> and they, I didn't have to look at myself. They had to look at me, and I was like, hey, it is what it is. Um, and I'm grateful that I, th I believe God held them. I believe God held them through many prayers and just revealing his ways and, and just enjoying each day and each conversation was, was how I approached it. Mm, thanks for sharing that, Jeremy. Uh, so, CJ, um, obviously, you and your wife... I've got three kids, which clearly means you know where babies come from. <laughs> but it happens so quickly, and they're all so small. And your kids are like little bumblebees. Yeah. They don't fly in formation. Um, they don't walk slow. Um, they're like a mini riot. Yeah. <laughs> they are full of life, and how... How do you father uh, these little bumblebees and your wife and responsibility and how was that going? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the bumblebees, I love that. I'm gonna afterwards, I'm going to tell them the uh, little bumblebees. Um, it's amazing. Um, I found that at this age, and my children are seven years old, five years old, and eight months uh, it's really in the simple things. It's the simple things that uh, hit them the most, that gets them the most. Uh, but the simple things aren't always the easiest things, especially when the simple things you didn't necessarily grow up uh, learning and doing and experiencing. So with me, uh, th obviously, there's a lot of responsibilities with the three kids, but you also have work. You also have your own issues. You also have uh, ministry obligations and things like that. And so it's very important for the kids I have at, my, at their age to know I love them, I hear them, I see them, and I value them. And it's not just showing them that, it's telling them that. And it's not just telling them, it's showing them. It's both things together. And so... Like when I love, when I say I love them, it's not just, uh, uh, they, you know, I, you know, I love you. Like, I don't got to say it because, you know, growing up for me, it was like that a lot. Like I, I knew my father loved me, although I didn't hear it necessarily. So now I make sure to tell my kids, hey, listen, daddy loves you. Like, I love you, my son, I love you. And as hard as that is to say sometimes, it's super simple, but it's not easy. And the, the I see you, like you're seeing, like, you know, if you, anyone who, even if you got nieces or nephew, they'll show you the same dance 50 times. They'll show you the same flip a thousand times. Daddy, daddy, look, 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 and it's the same thing, but it's like, yes, Cree, yes, and it's, I see you. I see you. You're doing a great job. I love watching you. Daddy, I hear you. I hear you. Yes, I hear you. And like, it's, it's just those little things and even th just how much they valued. Like uh, when they're at school or I'm, I'm at work, uh, when I see them later, they're like, did you know daddy missed you so much? Like I really missed you. And again, sometimes it's just expressing those things that we as men a lot of times get taught to keep in. 
And because we keep it in, we think that the people who we're called to or our kids or our wives don't need to hear those things or we rob them of, the, of actually hearing it. And so I just learned, like, you know what? Say it. Open your mouth and say it and show it. Um, and so you, they can never say, like, you never showed them or you never told them or it's awkward when they need it. Now you don't know how to say it. And so, yeah. So I am very intrigued. You use the word that it, it is hard for you. Yeah. The tension of not experiencing it personally growing up. Mm -hmm. What made you decide that I'm going to push through the awkward because my kids need something that I did not experience the same way? Yeah. I think it was as I grew up, finally hearing my dad get more comfortable saying I love you and what that felt like for me, what that did for me. Even uh, to this day, we might have a conversation on the phone and I can still tell as we get set to say goodbye, it's still hard for him to say like, I love you. So sometimes I say first, you know, like, I love you, dad. It's almost like, it's okay to say it, although you didn't grow up like that, although it's not the thing. And so just learning to do that. And I shared this story earlier, uh, with this generation of kids, they grow up with so much information. They get taught so many new things. And so I picked up my son from school the other day, my wife and I, and he gets in the car, my son is upset. And I'm like, what, like, what are you mad for? Like, what you upset for? And he's like, somebody was in my space bubble. I'm like, yo, what? <laughs> yo, space bubble, like, like, what is that? I'm asking my wife, I'm like, is that a toilet? What, 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 is, what is that? She's like, oh no, they teach them in school about barriers and how people need to stay outside of their bubble and if they're not comfortable with it, then say that. And I'm like, man, they're learning that like at a young age. That means I gotta up my communication with them and just to match what he's learning and what they're learning in school and things like that. So it's a lot of that learning and seeing where we are now, 2024, and how things are gonna progress. And like, I better be on it. Oh, that's so good. That is so good. So Ron Porter, I have known for such a long time. And for the longest time, uh, Ron had one prayer is that he wants a family. And for the longest time, the family was not coming. And I couldn't understand. There's a church so large and so many beautiful women, Ron. Just start on the left side and just make your way to the right. I, 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 don't, I don't get this. This is taking too long, but yet God, I've discovered that God, um, he's never late, but he misses all the good opportunities to be early, <laughs> right? But then at the end, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Tell us about your journey. Um, like, like Pierre said, I... I waited a very, very long time to be a husband and a dad, and I prayed for it um, a lot. And uh, to make it worse, um, I work here at the church, and uh, we had a Moms with Babies group uh, that met every Tuesday at the Greece campus. Um, and I had to go open the building and make coffee for them. And it was all my best friend's wives and their little kids, and, and I dreaded it so much because it, it represented everything I really wanted. Um, like, I'd be in the back making coffee with tears in my eyes because I'm, set, like, praying to have a wife and kids. There's wives and kids that I want my wife and kid to be spending, kids to be spending time with right there in the lobby. And I'm in the back with tears in my eyes praying for that. Um, it broke my heart every week. Um, but I always trusted that God had the best for me. And while I was taking care of his bride, the church, during that time, I always knew deep down that he was, he was preparing my bride. Um, during that time, I'd also have a few different guys come up to me in the church lobby with a, with a hey, how you doing conversation, uh, just to complain to me about how awful their wife and kids were, um, which, which brings me to my first couple pieces of advice. Uh, f um, first, your wife and your kids aren't the problem, bro. Uh, you are. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, the right answer to, to most of those issues is to just go home and love your family. Uh, don't disconnect. Don't hide from them. Don't bury yourself in work. Uh, just go home and love your family. They deserve your best. Uh, and, and second, uh, don't complain about what other people are praying for. 
uh, some, sometimes the person you're complaining to wishes they had the exact same problem you're praying, you're, you're complaining about. Um, and finally, just before I turned 40, um, I met Stacy, who was a single mom with a nine-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. And, uh, and within eight months, we went on our first date, got, got engaged, bought a house, renovated the house, planned a wedding, got married, moved in, got pregnant with Merritt, um, and like I said, eight months. Uh, we, we refer to that as, as Porter's Year of Favor. Uh, and there's a hashtag, you can check it out. Uh, as great as all that was, the first few months of living together was definitely a challenge, mostly because of me. Uh, after 40 years of living by myself, now there's not just my wife, but also two kids that are always there. Like, always. They, they don't leave, ever. Uh, they're, they're loud when I want it to be quiet. They want to eat like five, six times a day, every day. Uh, they don't eat normal food. They eat chicken nuggets and popcorn exclusively. And I used to be a chef, so that was a struggle for me. Uh, they're scared of bugs. They're scared of the dark. They always want something. They're climbing all over you. Um, which brings me to my next piece of advice. Uh, when, when God does answer your prayers, don't complain about... <laughs> Don't complain about how he answers them. Uh, remember, remember how long you prayed for them and be grateful for it. Uh, adjusting, adjusting to being a dad was also tough. Uh, apparently, not every kid responds well to being yelled at. And, uh, and rash, rash decision grounding them from their iPad for two weeks is way worse on the parents than it is the kids. Uh, but, but thankfully, Stacy let me be a parent. She let me make mistakes. She never corrected me in front of the kids, but she did give me a lot of feedback in private. Uh, it was so helpful, and I'm so grateful that, for that because she made me a better dad. Um, which, another piece of advice for, for blended families, let the new parent be a parent, uh, but help them with it. You know your kids well, but they don't. They, they will, but it'll take some time. Coach them through it, but not in front of kids. Don't diminish their leadership. Um, just before I, I officially met the kids at the beginning of our, our relationship, I saw, I saw our daughter Grace uh, over in the kids' wing, and, um, and God, like, like, it was kind of a shared awkward hi, like, a, like I said hi, but, and she's like, hi, because, like, who's this guy saying hi to me? Uh, but I, like, I knew I was just about to go on a date with her mom, um, so, uh, but, but God, and I'll, I'll never forget this, God, God, like, really was impressed on my heart. That's your daughter. Uh, you, like, you need to love her like a daughter, and she needs a good dad. Um, uh, and because of that, I, like, I've never treated Grace and Patrick as my stepkids. I've always thought of them as my own kids. And because I've thought of them that way, yeah. And, and because I thought of them that way, I treated them that way. Uh, we never used a step word step in describing our family. I'm their bonus dad, uh, not their stepdad. Um, I'm very intentional about spending one-on-one -on -one time with each of them. Uh, I take Grace on dates. Uh, we go to musicals, and I take her to really, really, really good restaurants because uh, I, I don't want some dusty boy taking her on a date someday <laughs> to, uh, to Olive Garden. And because uh, I, I, I don't want her to think that's okay. Like, it's, that's not good enough for her. Um, uh, and uh, She's, she's almost 16. She's wise beyond her years. And uh, she's become not, not just my daughter, but w one of my best friends. Um, Patrick and I played catch every morning in the driveway while he was waiting, the waiting for the bus. Like every morning, we'd play catch for half an hour. Um, I've taught him how to build stuff, how to turn our yard from weeds and moss into grass. Uh, and then we've, I've actually been teaching him how to golf now, too, which is great. Um, then uh, we, had, we had two more kids, uh, Merritt and Sammy. Um, that transition didn't really seem like a transition at all. It was more of a completion to our family. Um, the, uh, Patrick was super excited to have a little brother. Um, and they're, they're really our best buddies. They share the same room. They fight all the time. Uh, there's a, there's a eight year difference in their age, but like they, they're best buddies. Um, they, uh, they sleep in the same bed because Merritt's afraid of the dark and, uh, Patrick's just, He's like an awesome big brother. 
Um, Merritt and Sammy both, both want to be just like him. Uh, they're constantly playing soccer together. Sammy's first steps were towards a soccer ball because Patrick plays soccer. Um, and he's such a great role model for them to look up to. Uh, Grace is like a second mama. She, uh, she takes such good care of the little boy. She does art projects, grows a guard with Merritt, snuggles with Sammy, and she's really just incredibly helpful with them. Um, takes them off our hands when, when Stacy and I need a break too. She's so great with that. Um, the toughest part is actually when the big kids go to their dad's house for the weekend. Uh, Merritt especially doesn't really understand why he can't go too. Uh, and we all miss them when they're, they're, when they're not there. It's just a, a void in our house when they're not there. Um, and the, the transition when they come back home after a weekend, especially Merritt was, was an only child for a weekend, and now it wasn't really the case. It wasn't really the case now, but he was an only child for the weekend, and now he's got to compete for attention again. Now he competes with Sammy all the time now. Uh, but also different houses having different rules. It was tough for the big kids to transition back to. Um, all in all, our family is just like any other family. Uh, we do the best we can with what we've been given, and uh, we're super grateful that God brought us all together. It was definitely worth the wait. Um, oh, and that, that mom's group that met at the grass, Greece campus all those years ago, uh, Grace and Patrick are the same ages as those kids. Uh, Stacy's become great friends with those moms. That, that, that group became our small group. We meet every Friday night, and, and we go on vacation together. There's like 30 of us that go on vacation together. Uh, every year. Uh, so this will be the fifth year. Oh, so. that's so beautiful. God, God is grateful. God's good. Robo, I, I cannot wait um, for to... I wish I could be in every car because some wives, Adam, is going to look at us and go like, you're such a dusty man <laughs> taking me to Olive Garden. I cannot believe it. Dusty is the new word. That is it. So, Eric Rogers... We are kind of the uh, same place in life uh, because uh, Ron just said you have kids and they never leave. But your kids then leave, but they really don't leave. Their little presence and need for us, but they only need specific things from us. And yet... When they leave, you don't go like, thank God they're gone. Now we can just be us. It becomes actually harder. Tell us about your journey parenting kids that have now left home and give us some insight into that. Well, they, they actually don't leave. They, <laughs> but... but it, for for me, at least, one of the things um, um, I've been particularly sensitive to in my life was understanding the seasons of life I was in, how to navigate through certain things based on where I was at in my life and where I believe my family was at. And one of the things I didn't talk about earlier was about eight months ago last year when my mother was sick, that's when God kind of started showing me um, parenting. Because when there's a point that you may lose a parent, you, you begin to think about yourself and not so much um, was I a good father, but how well did I do? So one of the things I begin to, to kind of think about and, and, and started asking God for was, okay, what do they need now opposed to what I particularly would give them. And he started to show me um, in, in scripture, um, he said father derives from the Latin word foundus, which means foundation. And I said, okay, God, well, I believe I built a good foundation, build your family on Christ and the church and all this other sort of kind of stuff. And then he started taking me to some other scriptures. And then it, when it came to um, Benjamin, um, which I won't say skirts again, Pierre, but yeah, please anyways, don't. In the please first don't. service, he used the word skirts. Looking up my skirt. That's what he said. So, but they, they what did wear are skirts. you going to say? They, they did wear skirts, but anyways, in the Bible. But um, what he. No, they didn't look up <laughs> your skirt. Let's just be clear. <laughs> Their skirts, not yours. But keep going, keep going. <laughs> but, but. 
again, in, in all seriousness, he, he began to tell me to not just continue to show them what to build something on, but to show them how to build as you go through something. So he started asking me to unveil myself, you know, because as fathers, our, our children look at us as a source of strength and we provide, um, we never hurt, things don't bother us. And what I had to do at this stage of their, their, um, their lives, our kids are five years apart, 32, 27, and 22. They had to understand um, that there was a part of me, a vulnerability to me, that I had to, that I walked through things that um, were disappointing. I had to know how to walk through things when I didn't know if I had what it took. I didn't know if I could be a good father when I first had children. I didn't know if I could do this. How do I walk through failure? How do I walk through success? How do I walk through the interpersonal struggles that only you have within yourself that no one knows about, that you have to deal with because they're picturing me as someone who doesn't have any of that. So now I had to unveil myself and based on the maturation of who they are at the moment, when they would talk to me about certain things, I would be open and candid and honest and saying, you do have what it takes because I walked through this as well. This is what it feels like because I felt that as well. This is what it looks like when it feels like everything is coming apart. You can make it. In giving them my example, because they saw me as someone who could fight through anything, but letting them understand that the same thing that's in me is in you. And you can do it simply because it's not the foundation. It's the foundation that you've built, but through that foundation, you have to build it through some things in this journey called life. So good. Um, Eric, one of the things that I'm sure of, uh, people whose kids left home, uh, love knows no age. And when your kids ask and they land in situations and finances and what they want to do, how, how do you say no? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I say no, but I articulate it kind of differently. And I'm going to try to articulate this the right way. For me, what I found out was, is that me helping you could be also hurting you. What I also found out at the same time is when I said I was sensitive to the seasons that I was in, I had to now as a father be sensitive to the seasons that they were in. And, and, and then what happens is what we have to sometimes tell our kids is that there's three doors. Your life will consist of three doors at certain seasons of your life. There's a door that requires a key. There's a door that's a revolving door. And then there's automatic doors. Understand, and I'm, again, our kids are at five years interval, so they're in different seasons. So I've recognized that you're in a season that you have to do something to acquire the door to open. To, you have to use a key. So there's something you have to do. There's another door, which is a revolving door. Now, I know you, you want to walk through that door, and this door is revolving, but in order for you to get through that door, it's about timing. So you have good. to walk through that door at the right time, okay? And then there's automatic doors. Like Ephesians says, your gifts and callings will make room for you and bring you before great men. Just because things will begin to automatically happen in your life, and I see it happening in both of my children, the older one's life, it doesn't mean that you walk through every door just because it automatically opens because the real question is, just because it's good, is it God? 
So yeah. as I'm walking through this season of my life with them, me and my wife, we understand which door each one is standing in front of, and we try to appropriate what God has for us to tell them at that moment, which so minimizes them asking us for money. Yeah, my kids are watching online and they go like, yeah, we heard that. We don't buy that right now. And then there is Adam. Um, I, I fondly hold a letter on my computer from 2012, I believe it is, that we wrote to the parole board um, as Adam was doing prison time, not for murder. You are safe. You are just fine. For just... Uh, he is, he's the most paradoxical renaissance human that you will ever meet. You look at him and go like, what is it? Who is he? We had a businessmen small group during pandemic. Everybody's coming online with suits and work clothes. Adam is sitting without a shirt in the sun with his sunglasses. And I know they're thinking, who's this vagrant that is in our business group? And his business is probably bigger than all of theirs. Um, and so Adam uniquely has a story that is so worth celebrating because it's never over, never over. And Adam, share with us in your own unique way um, just how it transpired from that and where you are right now as a father. Sure can. So a little back history. I died a few times from a motorcycle accident. That's why my arms look like this. Went to prison, was told in prison I was gonna have a child, and I laughed at that. I never believed I was gonna have children. I ended up in a divorce, had to learn how to become a father all over again, remarried, and had another child, as you can see up on the screen up there. I have two children with two different marriages. One is 12, and the other, one, other one's a little crap head that's about 17 months old. He just runs my life. I need to point out being a good father means being a, great, um, being a great husband also. So treat your wife as there are still men chasing her. She'll make you flourish as a father. Look at that picture of my wife and me. There's a 20-year difference on it. I'm an old fart. I have to work super, super hard because she's changing my son's diapers now and she'll be changing mine in a few years. <laughs> I like to point out that I am a Christian father who still sins and makes mistakes, but I'm learning. But with all the years that I have from dying in jail and going through the divorce, I received a lot of wisdom from these experiences. As I was going through the divorce, I was trying to make, I was trying to take it, she was trying to take my child from me. I felt like my heart was being ripped out. That was when I realized how much time I was spending with the child and, and what I could lose. We would take our child and put him in front of the TV. That's what we did with our 12-year-old at the time. And we didn't spend any time with him. And that was a real harm I could see in our future. So if you have the chance, spend the time with your children. So I had a friend tell me one time, he said, listen, um, there was one day that my kid came and asked me and said, I want to play baseball with you today, Dad. And he said, not today. And he never asked him ever again. So for me, as a father, that has sat with me so deeply for so long. I may groan and moan when my child asks me to do something, unless I'm deathly sick, I take my butt out there and I do it with him. I sit on the ground and play cards with my youngest. I go outside and just, dad, just come sit outside with me while I'm out there. And I may have to do a little work, but I'm out there with him. The, the thing is, I'm always doing something with my children. And I am tired. Run a company with 50 employees, have this one year old. It is exhausting, but not exhausting enough that I want my children later in life to go, I wasn't there for them. That's super important to me. Uh, I need to become a better father and husband for my future generation, my children. Ooh. I'm not saying I, I never raised my voice, but I can tell you it's 90% better now. For my son has a res different respect for me now. He didn't have respect for me in the past. It was a real struggle because I was always angry all the time. But the wife I have now, though, she doesn't allow that in the house. She's very quiet. She's a book reader. She's completely opposite of me. We take, if I raise my voice, my, my children look at me like, what is wrong? I'm not saying perfect, that it's only 10% of the time that I might raise my voice now. Um, my faith has given me a second chance of being a father 
Being a divorced and remarried father has ups and downs. There's a struggle between us some days on my heart, how I protect my children with my heart in many different ways. Some, something believes she's starting to, sometimes I believe she's starting to understand with her own biological child how it feels. I was super worried how I was gonna love two children from two different women. That was a real struggle in my life. I was nervous and scared of how that was gonna work out, but it worked out just fine. I take these times in the morning. Sometimes my wife has, goes out with friends or she's gonna go shopping or she's gonna go do something or my son gets up super early in the morning. I just, my wife sleeps a lot more than I do. So I get up super early. So I take them downstairs and I just spend time with them. I'll change those vile diapers and those green boogers that look toxic. <laughs> I swear when he, they were born, they should slap a sticker in the butt that says, be careful. <laughs> but whether those moments are good or bad, they will never, ever, ever come again. You will lose on those moments. I've already lost once for the first three years. I won't do that again. If you're not present, I basically see all the first with this time with my first, my first son and I continue to do that. With my oldest, I had a lot of struggles from walking and talking and reading and all that stuff. With my new child, I don't have as many struggles because we really put our time into our children. We sit there. My wife spends a lot of time just teaching them over and over, talking to them. The TV is great, but when they're just listening to Mickey the whole time, how, what good is that sometimes? Don't get me wrong. Mickey's great. So is Miss Rachel when you need a small break. But your voice into their hearts is what's going to make them grow 100%. Uh, a couple things in closing. The reason why I become a better father. I, have, I belong in a men's group. It's super important. If you are in this room and you're struggling with something, which all men do, I can't, not one person here does not struggle with something, join a men's group. You will see that other men are vulnerable and that we have problems. But what happens when we have those problems is that we can talk to each other and we can work through it. But then when you sit down and you're like, ooh, you know what, I've had that same problem. He did a really good job on that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try what he's done. Serving in the church. I know they sit up here and talk. I don't work for this church, so when I say these next couple things, it's super important. Serving in this church is super important, too. You build a community. Every one of these men up here, I've either sat with or I do stuff with all the time. This was a pick group. I wasn't part of this pick of this group, but I can look across this board and know I've been with every one of these. And when you come to church on Sunday and your children come with you because they're excited to come to church, my children are excited to come to church. Are we going to church this week? And I only get my son 50% of the time, so I only have him two Sundays every, su or every other Sunday. So he's excited to come to church. So when you plant yourself and serve, they get to know other kids and they get to have fun here. Donating. This is a tough one for some people. Donating into your church. I have reasons why I do that because my children watch what's happening in our church, what we do behind the scenes. They get to see the church grow. They get a respect for the money and they get a respect for you, what you're doing with that. It's super, super important that you donate. I, I can't tell you the talks I've had with my child of why I do this and why the things I do for us. Pray with your kids. Pray with them at night before you go to the bed. Don't be afraid like Ron says or, or any of these guys ever say. Tell them that you love them. It's super, it used to be super tough for us to pray at dinner. Now it's like my youngest will, will take our finger and will hold it and he will pray with us at 17 months old. And when we're done and we pull our finger and she goes, Amen. But that's because we've been doing it for 17 months with him. Um, and the very last thing, this is going to piss a couple of fathers off, and it's okay that it does. This will. This may. Children are a gift from us, from God. All right? God's given this gift. He keeps them the holiest. They don't understand everything about God, so we have to protect their hearts. If you decide on Father's Day that you're going to go golfing without your children, I go to the bar with your buddies. Hey, what do you want to do today? I just want to go off my own. That's not being a father. What are you teaching your future children to do for you? And I struggle because I hear fathers do that all the time. And I'm like, great. It's Father's Day. You're being a father. Are you being a father if you're not around your children? Because what is that going to happen with those children when they get older? Are they going to think the same thing with their kids? Is that a great example for your kids? Right. Wow. You know, uh, that word he used is in the old King James, Pisseth. That's what he said. <laughs> so funny. I love this church. Where's Rufus? Rufus, let's close this out. <laughs> Can we say thank you to these guys? 
that did such a phenomenal job. So le let me close this out. Let me just speak to every heart of someone that has eyes on you. In Matthew, Jesus said these words. He says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Now, within a warning, it's a call for wisdom. He didn't say, I'm against profiting. He says, but if you are only for profiting, your soul is going to fade. And you say, so what does a soul make any? The soul is the very essence that God breathed into you. It's your identity and it's the life-giving force that you bring home. It is what you bring to hold, to protect, to be. And in the world that we are in, I don't know how to explain, and I've been wrestling with this probably now for three, four months as we, I love theology, I love conversations around it. I, I see things early, uh, things need to change. We live in a post-modern Christendom right now. Secularism is creeping in so fast and practicing faith is not just attending church, it's actually obeying and living a life that is honoring to God and attractive to the world because it's God's kingdom that comes. And one thing I know is that the world we live in requires us to work so hard just to provide. And there is a mantra that success promises you. And many families have heard this. If I can do this, then we can go there or we can get that. If only, then we. If only, then we. Can I tell you something? That is the biggest lie. You know why? Because statistically, I read the other day, lottery winners. Come on, how many of you have driven past the lottery board on your way to the city and go like, what would I do with all that money? First of all, I always think who I'm going to tell and tell him, you ain't getting nothing. That's my first thought. Just burning it, baby. This is, this is life just coming back at you. That's what I think. And you would think if somebody wins the lottery that they'll go like, I don't need more. But do you know that lottery, lottery winners incessantly plays the lottery after they win? Because more is never enough. Jesus says, you can lose your real self. Now you say, so how do I not lose my real self? The self that he is talking about is the breath that God breathed into clay. You know, when they bury people, you say from dust to dust, because I keep telling people, they say, so what is it like to see dead people when you've got to go to homes and bereavement and all of this? I said, you never wonder if something's dead. When you see dead, you realize how this is just a tent. This is, they don't even look asleep. They don't even look like themselves anymore because the soul, the life-giving essence is left. And God breathed your soul into you and our souls together is what makes our homes beautiful our families beautiful our community beautiful you say but if my soul feels depleted and empty there is another scripture the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he refreshes and restores my soul I want to say this the only one that can breathe regeneration into a life that feels depleted disappointed dismissed 
and our culture has done a fantastic job to take men out of their jobs as men and as people that brings to society something. It's not more, it's not less, it's not in general, but to show up and not be lonely, to show up and not be angry, to show up and not posture up, to show up and still have enough for the family. He, God, can restore and refresh. So my prayer is for every father, everyone sitting here. Don't watch reruns of Oprah for help. Dr. Phil ain't going to do it. Because he didn't breathe life into you. God is the only one. Listen, and he's not looking for you to be religious. He's not looking for you to be right or perfect. You know what he's looking for? For you to just look at the one who has the answer and say, God, here I am. Can you restore my soul so that I can show up and not give up? Because this is what we can do. Either CJ could have said, Nobody said, I love you, so I'm not comfortable. I am just going to continue to do the same thing. And he would have robbed his children of the validation of, I see you, I love you, I see you, I love you. And I say, maybe it's time for us to have restored souls so certain things goes to the grave and don't live on in our children so that our lives can be restorative lives. So the good news for us all, there is still a good shepherd. And all he seeks is for you to just look up and say, here I am. I need you to restore and refresh this weary heart. So God, praying for every single person in this place, especially for the fathers, for you say children are a blessing from the Lord. God, and they do so many things that challenges that statement. But they are a blessing. And Father, we are such stubborn children ourselves. We are so independent, self-reliant. Until life breaks down, then we run to you like we've always needed you but you never point us away when we come to you and today give us the courage to acknowledge you that you're a good father and that your breath in our lungs has given us identity restore and refresh our souls Every father, every man, and every family, oh God. That is our prayer right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank these men one more time? I'm going to invite you to stand on your feet. This may be strange, but lift your hands as high as it can go. You go like, what is this, a hold up? Well, if it's going to help you get your hands up, yes. Raise your hands. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, your Father and my Father, and the beautiful presence of His Holy Spirit that's always with you, be with you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Every time you think about God and look towards heaven, may you know that He smiles upon you and He knows your name and He is not afraid of your tantrums. And may God give you peace. Be blessed, church. We'll see you next Sunday.